Welcome to Celebrating Act Two. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back to Celebrating Act Two, everybody. And with us is our food and travel editor, John Mariani. John, how are you today? I am very well, John. Good to see you, Art. Well, good morning, John. John. Uh, I have to figure <laughs> no, out. I don't feel so. But to better, <laughs> is it uh, partner John and John? How's that? Uh, oh, that's John. good. Yeah. So, uh, John, uh, recently yes? you had a no. Your partner, John. <laughs> okay. Okay. Get it right. We'll train you. Uh, but John, John M., um, you recently uh, had an article in Forbes that mm -hmm. uh, uh, talked about the condition of the wine market today. Um, and it was really fascinating about the pricing and availability and what's good and what's not good. Uh, could you uh, share that with our viewers? Yeah, well, it's a buyer's market. Um, kind of always has been with wine. There's always been plenty of wine to go around. E even during the millennial year back in 2000, um, the champagne makers of Champagne in France said, you better buy up this bottle quickly. We're not going to have enough champagne for the, this millennial. And of course, there's always enough champagne. There's always millions and millions of bottles of champagne down in the caves, the caves as they call them. <clears throat> and they don't run out, um, which is to say that uh, what has been a chronic oversupply has now become uh, very much a glut in the wine world caused by several factors across the board. And we, the uh, buyers of these wines, are the beneficiaries, uh, whereas before we were the ones pursuing at very high price uh, a lot of stellar wines and a lot of not so stellar wines that just had good media hype behind them. John, I, I've always had um, a kind of a, a pecuniary rule that I didn't want to pay more than $30 for a bottle of wine, no matter how good it was. I've, oh, I've actually money. enjoyed some $100 bottles of wine. But if I'm buying wine for even a party or a special occasion, you know, 30 bucks seems to be my cutoff. And it has nothing to do with you know the quality of the wine. It's just my personal budget, really. You mean like is, like a four buck art? <laughs> <laughs> Two buck. <laughs> um, so uh, my question is that usually that had been got me a lot of good wines. Had a lot of selection of a lot of good wines, but recently you're saying that good wines that might have been fifty dollars a bottle have come down to my price range. Mm -hmm. Is that well? Is well that first of all, thirty dollars a bottle is is a very healthy price range insofar as a wide, wide uh, variety of really good wines. In the industry, premium wine category starts at fifteen. It used to be ten, then it went up to twelve. So that's the premium, and only about five percent of Americans ever drink above fifteen dollars. Okay? So if if I were having a party for twenty people, uh, my best friends at least half of whom don't really care about wine, some others who don't drink at all, <clears throat> and others who are wine snobs, um, I aim for a middle ground somewhere around that 15 to $20 level because I know I'm picking good wines. I'm not picking plunk. But the re the, to get back to the reasons why wine prices are coming down is because they said there's a wine glut all over the world. There's just too much wine and too few wine drinkers. The French and the Italians, who are traditionally the biggest wine drinkers, uh, the younger generation is not drinking as much wine. They're drinking better wine, but they're not drinking they're not drinking thirty dollar bottles of wine every night. So if an Italian kid or a millennial in France is uh, 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 going out with his friends, <clears throat> he's these days is likely to drink beer, or he's got he's going to have a, a carafe of wine or one good bottle for the four of them. So that's a problem in an industry which depends upon uh, um, uh, people growing into wine. Um, a lot of young people don't appreciate as much as our previous generation uh, did. And we were, frankly, uh, guys our age were the first ones, Americans, to really take wine as a serious beverage. I mean, you remember that 
if we had a really, really important date with a girl, it was Lance's rosé rather than the <laughs> you know, Maybe a nice bottle of Blue Nun because the, the, with the Catholic girls, you know, that, that would impress them. Um, so, and of course, there was Riuniti on ice, so nice. Um, and we, but by the 1970s, when we were getting cooler and there was much more available, we did start to drink Oh, Bola Suave and Valpolicella, and there was some nice uh, wines coming in from France that were not too expensive. And then we found out that the best wines of France were not all that expensive. I mean, even back then, I remember a college friend of mine and I actually bought a bottle of Lafitte Rothschild back in around 1968 for seven bucks a bottle, which blew our budget for the week. But I mean, that's not a lot of money for a wine that these days costs in excess of five, six hundred dollars a bottle. So the glut is caused by that, uh, uh, also by whole new countries, whole new continents have gotten into making wine and selling it worldwide that had never done so before. Australia, New Zealand, uh, throughout South America, Brazil, Argentina, um, Spain, which was always a big producer locally, but didn't really export much good stuff. Um, started to make really good wines. Sicily, um, the southern Italy, which was making Planck wines, um, they were making cooperative wines uh, that were matterized and oxidized, got their act together. So all of these people are entering a wine market that was doing just dandy without them, but now everybody's in it. So you could say, well, yeah, but that stuff is not as good as the traditional French and Italian wines are there. Are they? <clears throat> and the answer is absolutely yes. Both at the very high end and down at the low end, which is where the real real bargains are. So that if you were to spend, let's say, thirty dollars uh, just two or three years ago for an excellent Spanish Rioja from Priorat or something like that, um, whether or not it was worth every penny, you can now find wines made from the same grape, Tempranillo, out of South America which is selling for $12, $15. So the competition is fierce. Um, the other thing is, is that China was going to be the great, what dare I say it, the great yellow hope, okay, insofar as China, once it loosened up from the uh, communist regime, uh, there's <laughs> three billion Chinese who started to be interested in everything American, everything European. They wanted to have the uh, Louis Vuitton bag and they wanted to drink it with a great French wine. And because you had these automatic millionaires and billionaires, they were suddenly buying up the most expensive wines in the world, like Lafitte Rothschild and Romani Conti. That's all they wanted to drink, though. So they weren't drinking the types of wines that you and I would be drinking over dinner uh, tonight. They had no interest unless there was a name on it. If it didn't say Louis Vuitton, they didn't want the bag. If they didn't say Armani, they didn't want the suit. If it didn't say Lafitte Rothschild, they didn't want the wine. Which led to the Chinese putting labels that said Romani Conti on bottles that contained Chinese wine and selling them even at auction for thousands of dollars. Oh. So the Chinese market has not dried up uh, as much as because its economy has not been very good for the last four or five years, has uh, shrunk. And uh, they also have a problem. Every, every exporter tells me, a distributor of wines from around the world, and says, you better get paid up front by the Chinese or you'll never see the money six months from now. So um, for all these reasons, there is a big glut of wines, and we are the beneficiaries uh, of it all because now we can get terrific wines. And one last thing, the so-called trophy wines of California, like Harlan Estates, like Screaming Eagle, <clears throat> wines that the media, like Wine Advocate and uh, Wine Spectator, gave 95, 100 points to. Well, this caused people to scramble. I will pay anything for a case of that wine. Anything. Name your price. And that went on for a few years. But what happens, especially in California, where you have um, pretty much good weather and a good vintage almost every year, Sometimes you have a drought, which is not bad for good wines, but whether you have a drought or fires, it doesn't radically affect either the supply or the quality of the wines. So in Europe, in France and Italy, by law, 
if you are one of the greatest states, like a Romani Conti or a uh, Gaia uh, Barola, you are only allowed by law to make so many bottles out of the acreage you have because they don't want you to dilute the quality of the wines by planting, over planting and expanding to territories that not that's not in the terroir. So you can if you let's say I'm making this up, but um, I think, as a matter of fact, um, Lafitte Rothschild makes something like 10,000 cases a year and that's it over there. The same exact wine that they have in oversupply goes into another bottle, same exact wines, labeled as their second label. And they're not trying to kid anybody. Um, fact of the matter is you get the same wine in a different bottle, but you just they're not telling you which ones are which. It's different in California. So let's say Screaming Eagle or, or Harlan or uh, Camus uh, Select has an overabundance of wine one year. Usually they allocate these wines. You may only buy a case. You are a subscriber to our, our um, wine club. You are only allowed to buy two bottles. A restaurant in Las Vegas, which is begging to have a case. All right, we'll sell you a case, but you have to buy six cases of our other lesser wines. So this is the way it, it was. Now, if you have an oversupply, they sell it off to a middleman and that middleman, he's not going to call it uh, Harlan. He'll call it Coleman Stellas if he wants to. But that's the same wine. The big guys, the prestigious uh, wineries, don't want you to know that. There's no way to know that unless you taste <laughs> Coleman Cellars wine. Say, you know, this tastes a heck of a lot like that big, expensive $1,000 bottle of, of Harlan, Harlan and Screaming Eagle. But that's the way it works. So, yeah, there's some terrific wines out there for a lot less money. So, great information. What? Well, I want to know about Coleman Cellars. Give it, give it, hold it out <laughs> of me, John. Hey, I want the profit on that. Yeah. Okay. You could. Uh, John, you know, how long do you, you know, think? You guys what, what, are Kirsch, you could Kirsch sellers You could buy excess wine up in Napa and bottle it as your own if you got approved by the DATF and all of that. Um, nothing says you couldn't bottle that wine and uh, sell it for fifteen dollars a I bottle might, and you only paid four. You know, for, the uh, for a wine, Kirsch, is, it sounds just about right, doesn't it? Kirsch, 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 Kirsh, 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 make wine they're they're kind of like cows the cow has to be milked and yeah. when you have um uh wineries in napa valley where uh still today if you want to buy an acre of land for vineyard uh development um a million dollars an acre is what you pay you've got to get that investment back somehow yeah you know, sell it off yeah. So it's going to go on and on for a long time. And uh, dare I mention the dirty word, coronavirus is going to have an effect on all of that because people are not going to be buying. They'll still buy wine, but everybody's watching their pennies, e even the pennies for the $15 wines bottle. Sure, sure. Right. Well, I, I'll tell you, John, in a, uh, in a future interview, let's talk about how you can determine – um, the the fifteen dollar wine, the the good wine that you sure. like, at the ten dollar fifteen dollar level versus the thirty dollar level, because that's uh, I think that's key to it. It's it's knowing what is the better wine. Absolutely. Am I correct? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, we could we could spend certainly another segment or more on that. Great. Good. Well, and you're the man to to tell us about it. So, um, Art. Uh, you know how to get a hold of John's newsletter, don't you? Yeah, you go to our website, celebratingact2.com, go to contributors, click on right. contributors, and Virtual Gourmet is right there. And it'll link you right to it, and you can subscribe on his website, johnmariani.com. That's right. And of course, of course, the key is to go to celebratingact2.com. 
dot com first. Right. Uh, so who, if you uh, shameless plug, <laughs> shameless plug. Absolutely, everybody should make money on this. Yeah. <laughs> John, thanks for the in, uh, the insights and the information. Great stories about wine. Uh, it's fascinating. Even if you're not a wine connoisseur, um, I know what I like, but I don't know the labels. And I, we have some in-laws who love. Uh, they have a label. Uh, they just this is their label. If it's, I don't want to say the name of it, but if it's a wine with this label, they'll buy it. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, I'm just the opposite. I love to taste uh, and experiment with wine. So we'll talk about. All of that in another episode. Uh, in the meantime, I want to say thank you and uh, ask okay. everybody to go to, to celebratingact2.com. Let us uh, thank you for helping us celebrate your second act, your celebrating right, act. For more on Celebrating Act 2, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.